Welcome to another episode of Tales from the Tables with your host, Rob Radley, John Charles Ciccarelli, James Burroughs, and Damian Hallwood. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Tales from the Tables. Uh, this is your host, Rob Bradley, and we will join always, as always, by our co-hosts. We've got Jason, Hello. James, Hi. and David. Hello. Hello. Hey, guys. How you all doing? Hey. Very good. Yeah, um, all good. yeah very good. Doing yeah. well. Other than my oh. car having broken down this week. We're all oh, good. God's sakes. Really? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. The, uh, the engine oil filter exploded. Uh, I think it was oh. a technical term the mechanic used. <laughs> it exploded. And that is the that is while uh, you were driving. Cold. Um, yes. Yeah. Jesus Christ! What was that like? Uh, fine. I just had to wait uh, at a services for okay, cool. um, for someone to come pick me pick me up and my car right. up. Fun. Um, so luckily, I did managed you exceed? To... Did you exceed the two hour minimum service <laughs> thing that you spent yeah. you know, for free? Really? How much? How much did you have to pay to stay there? Um, sixty-four pounds. What? <laughs> to wow. be parked in the services? Yeah. Do they think you're a truck driver or something? Uh honestly, Rob, God knows. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> so you had to pay sixty-four pounds for parking. Yeah, and then because I was slightly too far away from home for my breakdown cover to cover me, I had to pay another hundred pounds to get towed Ooh, home. Wow. <laughs> What? Because otherwise, apparently they can only take me ten miles, which is great unless you break down ten miles away from home. Ten point one mile or something, yeah. right? Oh my good and then the Oh jeez! So, what a pain in the ass! Yeah. So well, well you're safe. Before, then, though. <laughs> so, so silver linings, you're safe. Uh, your car is being worked on slash is worked. It is. Um, it's, it's there we go. Yeah, and apparently know. you're doing great. So um, I'm, doing fine. <laughs> I'm yeah, no right. expert on vehicle techno babble, but exploded sounds serious, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one level above combusted and one level below completely uh, like atomic explosion, I think. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> Evaporated. Muscle. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Freaking, that's freaking Singularity. Somewhere between evaporated and combusted, that's uh, exploded. It's slap at the middle there. Oh, God. Uh, to be fair, I think I'd rather my filter evaporate than explode while I'm in the car. Well, but yeah, right. glad you're okay, mate. Sorry about that. No, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's fine. These things happen. Um, Apparently. Anyway, this. Anyway, Robert, can we uh, put a link to my GoFundMe in that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. I'm good. So, how, how much? Are you, how much are you down altogether? How much? You, what's, what's um, so, you? I think. I think at the end of it, it's it's gonna have cost me around five hundred, including the park, the park for the parts and getting, yeah, getting home. The parts. God's and sakes. And what? What? Um. How old? How old is your car? Um, five years old, and I've had it eight months. Eight months. Did yeah. you buy it from a dealer or from yes. private? Dealer. Warranty? No. No. <laughs> no. They didn't give you a warranty at all. <laughs> six month warranty. <laughs> a six month warranty. Wow. Those Small. Cheeky. Two fuckers. months. Two, Two months, months out, out your warranty. Oh god. Wow. Yeah. So. What an absolute fucker. Yeah. Is there, no, is, there no, fucker. is there no? Is there no? Is there no way you can like look at it and go, "Well, hold on a second. This was obviously a fault that was like." Well, gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> yes, especially as the mechanic took a look at the filter and went, this is the worst possible filter that money can buy <laughs> that they've put in this car. <laughs> it's not the standard oh, one. That they had... Clearly the dealership has added this in and it has then exploded. So should we name, should we name, should we name and go. shame the dealership? Should we name and shame um, I don't know legally if that's, <laughs> if that's the best decision. 70... <laughs> <laughs> You can well, just march up to them and be like, well, you're featured on the Tales from the Table podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> they said you were shit. Your business will suffer, <clears throat> Nissan, yeah. or whatever yeah, it is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, it exactly. rhymes with shwi 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 shwa. And what, ah, were you, where were you, right, where you, right. what, so you were at a services, were you driving, were you, where were you driving to? Were you driving uh, I was driving, uh, well, I was driving from the gym to, um, to Norwich to see Jade. <laughs> Oh right! Oh yeah, okay. there's your there's your problem right there, Norwich. Yeah. So, <laughs> so technically, it's her fault, really. 
No. <laughs> smart. I'm, smart. I'm, she listens I'm to this. Answer, right? Correct answer. <laughs> yeah, right. Good job. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> well, amazing. Glad you're okay again. Yeah. No, oh, all good. good stuff. So, so I imagine well, you've had better weekends. <laughs> Uh, I can't try to think what, I've, what I did this weekend. What did I do this weekend? I was roasting, like co- ago, roasting right? coffee for most of it. Nice. Yeah, nice. roasting coffee. I've, I've, I've set up a um, a pop up. What's what? I, what have I called it? I've called it the 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 coffee the pop up coffee stop in my village, mm. where basically pop I'm up just coffee stop. pop up coffee stop. Nice. Yeah, I've basically got a co- like a stop like a pop up coffee stop where I'm selling coffee to villagers. Beautiful. Yeah, it was nice. I did it. I did it Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and yesterday morning. Uh, Tuesday morning, I had to I had to finish at like ten because it started to rain. And then yesterday, mm. I finished at about about eleven. But it's just, it's good. I'm there from seven a.m. to eleven. It's Not pretty too cool. Bad. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Selling selling coffee for two pound fifty a cup. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No pretty reasonable because it's like now three pound yeah. forty a cup. Jeez. Yeah, Starbucks horrendous. is worse than that if you want a, a large, oh, which God, I always yeah. do because I'm perpetually tired. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Awful. It's like it's like massive, like chunk of money. Like I think mean, Starbucks in in London was like four quid for a regular for like a yeah, yeah for like a regular like a regular latte like a regular large latte Oof. a reg- no yeah. a lot regular latte yeah four quid something like that. And that's what that was some sort of caramel sauce that Rob's has has in it and vanilla syrup and yep. marshmallows and chocolate sprinkles. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if you're gonna do it, you've got to go all out. You've yeah, got to make sure you right. have a coffee that isn't a coffee. That just, yeah. just becomes like a a dessert. It's a tiramisu. It's a tiramisu. A tiramisu. <laughs> Take away tiramisu. Greetings, fellow adventurers. Are you tired of using subpar tables for your epic tabletop quests? Absolutely. We need something that matches the grandeur of our adventures. Well, fear not, dear listeners. Allow us to introduce to you Robert Rose Carpentry. Established for 10 years as a specialist in crafting bespoke gaming tables that are as functional as they are beautiful. Built to precision, with custom add-ons and exclusive features, 100% sustainable and environmentally friendly, Every inch of their gaming tables are made from reclaimed wood, then crafted into a solid masterpiece that will last aeons. And here's the best part. As proud sponsors of Tales from the Tables, Robert Rose Carpentry are offering an exclusive 10% discount to all our listeners. Imagine the thrill of transforming your dining table into a custom-built gaming experience for you, your friends, and your family to enjoy time and time again. So don't wait any longer. Head over to www.robertrosecarpentry.com forward slash tales from the tables and use the code RollDark10 to claim your discount at checkout. Craftsmanship, adventure, and savings. What more could you ask for? Thanks to Robert Rose Carpentry for supporting our podcast and enhancing our gaming experiences. Absolutely. Now let's roll those dice and weave some epic tales. Indeed. Until the next time, adventurers. You know, I, for for so many years, I was so proud of not being a coffee drinker because I could just wake up and go, basically. Like a shower was really all I needed to wake myself up in the morning. Um, and I'm still sort of like that, but I've now started taking uh, more and more, or either it's coffee or some sort of energy drink um, mm-hmm. on, t- on Tuesday nights because I have a game that I started with friends, that home Icewind Dale game is from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. my time now Ooh. because I moved back to New York and all of those friends are still in California. So I, oh, wow. uh, yeah, I'm like, and I have a, a game usually before that earlier in the day and usually no time to nap. So by the time 10 p.m. rolls around, I'm like, yeah, I could do this. And then by midnight where I'm taking my break, I'm like, <gasps> caffeine, <gasps> please. Oh, I'm dying. Man. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Out. Uh, yeah, surreal. that's impressive. Yeah, but then after, but then that gets me going enough, and that two a.m. rolls around. I'm like, ooh, I'm wired. I guess I'll just go on the internet for an hour and doom yeah. scroll or whatever. <laughs> I've, oh, I've, God, started, I've started an in-person game with my friends back home, and because everyone is a night owl, it's just okay. We'll start at seven, uh, and mm. that ends up being we get there at seven, and we start at eight, and then we'll go till two in the morning playing like the yeah. six-hour session of. Nice. Ah, uh, the classic six. <laughs> yeah. 
There's the, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've I've really missed like a long form campaign. I've not been in, on one for absolutely donkeys. I could I'd love it. I love it so yeah. much. It's such a it's especially especially with like your good group of mates and you're just like mm-hmm. you know you're yeah. at home or you're someone's house and it's like a really comfortable surroundings. You've got candles lit. You know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe you have a cigar, maybe you have a bit of whiskey. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever your bag oh, is. Oh, that sounds. Right? You got your smoking jacket rubs. and everything going. Smoking jacket on. You know, just, you know, <laughs> shout. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Shit. No, James, we're talking about D and D. Please, not oh, that sorry. D&D. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's nice. It's nice to not have the pressure, like to to get to the point where you're like, okay, I've prepped for six hours, but if you guys go really off the rails or you blast through everything in three and a bit hours, I could just be like. Great, you've done everything. I don't have anything prepped. <laughs> you can carry on if you guys want, but I don't have anything prepared. I li- I have to improv it. So just so you're aware of that, is that okay? Right. And if not, we can be like, should we could just we'll just hang out instead, shall we, for the rest of the evening? We'll just come back to this next time. We could pick it up. However yeah. long the session ends up being, it ends up being that long. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which right, is yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I miss the six-hour sessions, too. That's how I started playing D&D. I lived with yeah, all of the same. people that I played with, and so we were all flatmates. Uh, um, and we had one one sort of rotating guest spot. Um, and we would play on Saturdays. I think we'd we'd wake up, like you know, Saturday, 10 a.m., whatever. We'd start playing at noon. We'd play till 6 p.m. It basically ate up the whole chunk of the day. And um, the wife of one of our players like started hating that we were just ordering food and eating junk. So she started making us food, um, like yeah, healthy nice. options. Yeah. And Aww. we'd all chip in, obviously, for groceries and time cooking and stuff like that. And but yeah, those those were the days. And then there were the couple of Saturdays that we did like the double sessions because we missed something and we'd play from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Yeah. That's 12 where 12 hours of D&D. That's where stress blueberries came from in my home campaign. Um <laughs> Because there was too many, that? too many stress sweets were happening, and everyone was kind of uh, panicking yeah. that they were consuming too much sweet food and junk food, and so it was replaced by stress blueberries, and it sort of become a thing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I may have mentioned it before, but I remember when I really early when I was first playing three point five edition of D anD D around school, and mm. we were we were playing at a friend's house. He lived on a farm, so it was super atmospheric because it was just a house in the middle of fields. There was nothing else around. Um, yes. And we were playing and playing and playing, and then we heard a car coming up his driveway, which is a long farm driveway. Nobody comes up that driveway unless they have a reason. And we said, there's a car coming up your drive in the middle of the night. Dude, what, what's going on? <laughs> Ran to the window, look out. It's the milk truck. Uh, the, the, sun is, the sun is slowly climbing over the horizon. Oh, it's like five God. o'clock in the morning. <laughs> sure. If only, if oh, only. Those were the days. I'm pretty well, sure we've... Stress Bru- Sp- uh, Stress Blueberries is a known character in one of my games. I know. <laughs> I was going to say that sounds like an NPC name, like a tabaxi <laughs> bar. Do you meet somewhere? <laughs> it is now. Blueberries. Yeah. We we actually Excellent. have a um uh, a three a three day D and D getaway thing planned in late July, um, which uh, is exclusive. Actually, I've I've not told anyone about this yet. Um, mm. It's gonna it's gonna be in Shrewsbury at a at a very fantastic like property. I think it's got like some like seven bedrooms en suite. We're getting a, a chef in as well to do all the food for those three days. Um, it's uh, we haven't quite finalized it exactly yet, but it's on the horizon. It's coming up, and yeah, I think we haven't quite decided who's gonna be the DM yet. It may very well end up being myself that DMs. Nice. Um, I mean, if it sounds Actually. too stressful, Rob, I, it feels like you're doing a lot. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Green Agent Shrewsbury. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great, uh, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Should be a lot of fun. Um, oh, is, my, is that my phone to get to make it there? Mm, I hope Anyone it's not mine. Oh. Yeah, I hear it. Uh, it it's it's gone. I've moved my phone away from everything. Let me just... Uh, yeah, airplane mine's mode at on arm's there. Airplane That's mode on there. odd, because I didn't hear it. But oh, did you not? No. Oh, oh. That's weird. it was like a really old interference sound. I haven't heard that yeah. in years. Yeah, maybe someone, some time travelers, come come forward in time. <laughs> That's how I used to know I'm that I was getting a, a text. My yeah, me too. Do that on my... <laughs> <laughs> when I was back at school. It's great that little thing. The, the <laughs> days of modems. That yeah. same, that yeah. same yeah. friend uh, that Something's whose coming. house. <laughs> that same friend whose house we were at. Um, 
his his modem I think got struck by lightning like three times. What? <laughs> Jesus! It struck the house and sort of rolled down the cables into the into the modem. It was crazy. Dad had a friend that's going to be epic, time. though, playing playing D&D in the middle of a lightning storm out in the country. Sadly, I don't think... Uh, we never got yes, those production right. values. It, it never happened <laughs> while we were uh, playing, right, right. sadly. Ah, but... uh, gotcha. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. That, would have, that would have been really sick. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, so this this event we're doing, um, we're opening up ticket sales soon. I've not, I think we're going to be limited to just six people, just six players. So, yeah. That's come, that's when, when is this happening? You said? End, end of July. Ah, I'll end be on July, holiday. Yeah. That's that's annoying. <laughs> yeah. I think from the twenty seventh, oh. I'm in in a Mexico. I'm oh, I love Mexico. In the, I might be in the UK actually for Fringe Ooh. for the setup of Fringe. Oh, cool. Nice. Maybe. Well, let I'll me just let me get, let me get further I'll just, details. I'll, I'll um, just creep behind the window, being like, "How's just, it going, um, guys?" <laughs> yeah, right. I'll just, I'll just. This is this is the venue, by the way. Um, have a look at that. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna release the venue one to tell the tells the tables podcast, but you just have a look, see what you think. I will. Oh, oh right, okay. Look. Oh, we're we're, we're hey. editing this out. Oh, oh crap! Hell. That's, That's beautiful. It. Yeah, oh, wow. incredible. Nice. Shrub- Shropshire, Shrewsbury, Shropshire. Yeah. So you see the, one, the big fire, the big fireplace and stuff, and the great yeah. see the big table, yeah. the chairs. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's the like, that's the room. So that's, oh. so that's going to be the room. Oh, that's yeah. like a courtyard in the. Oh, I'll tell you what, this, this basically place it's basically like the perfect place. <laughs> yeah. James is like, tell you what, Mexico is cancelled. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, I'll, run it, I'll run it by Jade. I'll see what she says. Good. I, I have a feeling. I know the answer. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's west of Birmingham. So where, where, in, where in Mexico are you going, James? Uh, just south of Cancun, Playa del Carmen. Oh yeah, Tulum, Tulum, Turin is uh, it? Near, near Turin? Tulum, yeah, Tulum. Near Tulum. Uh, yeah. Because I, 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 I stayed at a place. Uh, there's basically there's one road, and it's yeah. just jungle, 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 jungle resort. Jungle, yeah. jungle, 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 jungle resort. Jungle, 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 jungle resort. That's where and I'm I, at. I was. I was at one of those bar. Oh, what was it called? Oh god, what was it called? I try. I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, anyway, yeah, it was really nice. And but the food was sh- the food was shockingly shit. Uh, oh yeah. So um, just bear that in mind. When I was, when I was there, <laughs> when, I was, when I was there, I was like, I was like, I walked into the thing because it was all it was all fully um like full of what all full, inclusive, all, all inclusive, all inclusive. All inclusive yeah. yeah. Went in there and I was like, I was like, where's all the Mexican food? <laughs> the guys like the guys like, oh, we have we have echeladas over here. It's like a little tiny little area where they had echeladas, mm. and the rest of the place was just literally just catered for like. Just you know, chips, burgers, that type of thing. We had a lot of Americans that would come there. I think. Yeah, sure. I think they were sure. just they sorry. Were just I'm that. sorry. I, I'm apologizing. And I was like, advance. I was like, what? Where's like? <laughs> I like the, the, the only burrito I had when I was there was in the airport. Wow. That was it. And we From we had to, we had lip. to we had to <laughs> yeah. literally we had Taco to literally Bell. beg we had to beg to get an, to get a taxi to come pick us up to take us to Playa de Carmen. So we could go to like, so we could go like check it, check that out. Go to the town. They were, they were like, why do you want to leave? We were like, well, because that's Mexico out there, and we want to go and have a look. Yeah. No, you gotta stay here. I'm like, no. I "I want to go and have a look. (laughs) (laughs) You're in Playa del Carmen. We have uh, a uh, like the Tulum ruins. There's uh, yeah, Coba ruins, which is a pyramid that you can climb. That's really beautiful. We did Coba, yeah. Co- yeah, yeah Coba, I remember Coba, Damon. I think you were my saying favorite uh, favorite trip that I did in Mexico because it just feels very exploratory to go this like trail through the jungle, get to this big ancient Mayan like pyramid, and then be able to like climb to the top of it, stand on, and just look out over the top of the jungle. I'll just... I'll tell you what. Um, we we've done Mexico a couple of times. It's a bit of sweet, which I can I can get into. Um, but uh, we've done Mexico a couple of times. And speaking of lightning, we when we went inland to uh i think it was for coba um the heat was Oof. it felt it honestly felt it's the hottest i've ever felt just open air mm. it was like being mm. wrapped in cling film you could feel the air hugging you it was so hot oh, and oh, wow. we had Ooh. we had uh thunder we didn't get any lightning it was in the day but we had thunder and the thunder shook the earth i've never known thunder wow. like it it was How cool is that? it was the thunder of the gods it really was it was it nice. was so loud and it you could feel the ground pulse when it when it hit it was so epic <laughs> yeah I, well, I went during the hurricane season which is because it was cheaper um <laughs> the last the one of the times i went 
And yeah, we got caught in <laughs> what felt like a monsoon storm. Like we were doing archery out in this monsoon. And let me tell you that if nothing has made me feel more like a fantasy character at Helm's Deep than doing archery in, <laughs> in a monsoon. In monsoon rain, just like <laughs> clothes stuck to me. Just like how did they how did they do this? <laughs> Because they Man. didn't want to die. Where, that's, that's, where was this place exactly? Um, what what was the name of it again? Is it Koba? Koba Co- is Koba? the, the ruin. I think yeah. that's the one where it was the the heat. It wasn't. It definitely wasn't Chichen Itza, um, which we also did. Yeah, it's, it's really it. great inspiration for tabletop stuff. Like anything, it is anything chalk based that you want. If you're in a rainforest and there's these ancient temples and stuff, it's really cool. And then you've got all the cenotes, yeah. the underground rivers, and things like that. And yeah. I love the tours and nice. the four guys talking about the the main history and and, and things like that. It's so interesting. Mm. yeah, it's it's really it's really fucking cool, isn't it? It's it's <laughs> yeah, it's they're, they're it's legends. so it's so so dark though. What what like yeah. happened with like Cortez and stuff and oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God, it's so dark. I've, I've Just been, I've the been, worst. I've been, I've been really getting into Graham Hancock recently. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him at all. The oh, um, is an is a is well, he's actually a journalist, but he's he did um this thing on Netflix called the uh, oh, ancient apocalypse. And he believes that there's, that there was um, a race of people that existed before um, that basically taught all of the ancients, all the things that they know. So all of like, mm. you know, farming and all that kind of stuff. He basically taught all, they taught like all the hunter gatherers, but they existed be- before the great flood. And that in every culture, there's this, this there's a story about this story. Great flood that happened. Right. And that before that time, there was this culture that would like, you know, would give them all these tools and amazing things da da da. It's a really interesting. It's a really interesting documentary series, um, but he has come under fire because in a lot of this, in a lot of these ancient cultures, there are these. There's the, the stories that have been created by about this like traveler that came to them that give them that gave them all these like you know things. They believe well, archaeologists believe that those stories were made up by the Spanish and the Portuguese in order to sort of um, subtly give them like a way into. A way into Catholicism and a way into like Christianity. Mm. Uh, yeah, it makes sense, it's, yeah. it's really it's really interesting. But Graham Hancock's like, no, 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 no. He was they were they were from an old civilization. It's a proper thing. And and that there's a really interesting podcast with um, Joe Rogan, him and this architect having it out. They're literally arguing it out together. It's really good. You should what you should listen to. Even if that sort cool. of stuff is batshit insane, it sounds it's really it is interesting to listen to because oh yeah, if anything, for the basis of fantasy a world building. It's cool to to take that and run with that, I guess. In oh yeah, in D&D absolutely. Games, you're like, oh, okay. Well, what if in my world there was a a race of beings who were wiped out? Okay, what wiped them out? What did they pass on? What are the stories that are now told about them thousands of years? Totally. After they, yeah. after that's happened to them. It's, it's oh, you really know, like cool the content that was left out of Vecna. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm not salty. Oh, I'm not suddenly salty. got Don't so worry, dark in here. All this was it 50 years ago or 40 years ago that happened? Oh, God. That. Okay, so Rob is referring to a rant that I put out yesterday because <laughs> in the in the prequel adventure, this is worth mentioning, and I'll call you out, Wizards sure. of the Coast. Yeah, um, in, in the prequel adventure that was released on D&D Beyond, which is called Vecna, Nest of the Eldritch Eye, it begins by saying, um, 50 years ago, Mount Hotnow erupted as they're sort of just setting up the history of the city that you start in, Neverwinter. And they say 50 years ago, Mount Hotnow exploded. And there is a very canonical date for the explosion of Mount Hotnow. It's uh, 1451 Dale Reckoning, right? If you're right. giantly into all of the Forgotten Realms lore and, and nerdy stuff. Yep. Um, yeah. then, which, which, which majority <clears throat> of people who are probably into this book will be into Of course. It, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Vecna has been around for nearly the entire history of D&D, which is nearly 50 years. So if we're talking about 40 yeah. plus. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, um, uh, yeah. Exactly. Of course. So, and this adventure is billed as a prequel to the actual Vecna Eve of Ruin full campaign, which then came out. And at the top of it, it says, if your characters begin in Neverwinter, this bustling city that has recuperated from the explosion of Mount Hotno 40 years ago. So is it 50 or 40? <laughs> <laughs> um, canonically, it probably should be the 50 version, which in other words would put us at the cross of the century because that would mean it's 1501 DR, um, which... Mm never been officially done before 
Um, I don't know that anyone has uh, like officially come out and said, yes, this is the exact date, but I'm, I'm going with the free prequel adventure on D and D beyond for the canonical starting date, because I, I think 40 years ago, putting it, putting this adventure at 1491 DR, there's still other stuff that happens in 5e canon. I think, um, uh, the events of Waterdeep Dragon Heist all happen in 1492 or or later. I think Descent into Avernus is technically canonically 1492 as well. So yeah, it just makes more sense that Vecna is after all of this stuff. So yeah. there you go. But the the loss of consistency between adventures is what drives me nuts. That's that's my my platform for the day. <clears throat> too, too, too many chiefs. <laughs> Well, too many chefs, sorry. I think it, uh, maybe. I, I honestly think there's just probably different teams working on it, if I'm just speculating. Different teams, uh, people not really caring about canon yeah. as much as they once probably did, even though, you know, nerds like us eat that stuff up. You know, we, we want to know exactly what date it is. I know a lot of my players constantly are, like, fact-checking me on forgotten realms lore and they're like oh well you know you said this started in 1496 and this would this person would only be two years older at this point i was like oh oh, okay yeah you're right it's it's a real it's a real short-sighted thing for them to do because they they really don't understand their audience if that's if that's something that they're just like oh yeah we'll just say 40 years ago oh we'll say 50 years ago and uh, right there's no like and there's no like okay we need to check this does this line up like how could they not like Yep. Mm-hmm. That, that, yeah, that to me just seems so short sighted and so lazy and so like it just says they don't care. Yeah, I wish I wish there was a positive way to spin it, but like you don't need you you yeah it, it, this was so avoidable. You know, it was just such an easy little thing that could have been avoided. And I know that they've come out in the past with these adventures and said that the canon isn't really strictly their top concern. That, you know, that you can set the adventure whenever you want. And the answer to that is, of course we can. If we wanted to, we can change everything about this. We could also completely homebrew our own adventures. Oh, wait, we already do. But if you're already here giving us, selling us a book with an actual event that you want to leave in the canon of D&D, of the Forgotten Realms setting at least, then give us the date. (laughs) It's not that big of a deal. Exactly, exactly. It's, It's ridiculous. But hey ho, I mean, hey ho, you know, one of those things. Right? But but um, but getting you to play Vecna is gonna be pretty cool. It is, it is. I honestly, in in some ways, I know I've done a lot of complaining over the past couple of weeks, but um, it's a gift. I've never. This has sort of reinvigorated and re-inspired me to like kind of write this epic adventure and and i have a great framework like the again the premise is excellent and the just the existing lore and history of vecna and all the characters around him and his multi-edition sprawling prehistory it's all there so it's all there for me to pick and choose from and, and weave into this epic tale and Honestly, I'm seeing that happen on Reddit, on YouTube, on on many different platforms of people just coming up with these really cool and awesome sounding campaigns. You know, Damien, you mentioned that you're probably going to you're looking at maybe running this yourself at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was requested uh, that my players post Icewind Dale, which finished capped out at level 10. So it's perfect. Uh, will follow on into oh great ruin so we're in the, the the sort of pre-stages of planning that out now to, to same, jump on very soon same, same characters uh mostly i think there is at least one player mm. who's looking to change character um, that's great but yeah. that's great though that's great that's really cool i love it i love it when that, that when that kind of thing happens because it's such a like a nice because they're, they're already they're already established yeah they've right got their, they've got their backstory with each other from icewind dale it gives gives you so much content you can put in there based on what their adventures in Icewind Dale and stuff. And it does. It, yeah. Are you, are you gonna are you gonna set it in like like several years in the future, or have you made that sort of decision? They are gonna have a little bit of downtime, um, but probably not probably not years. Um, okay. I also managed to squeeze in hours. Yeah. Not even a long rest. <laughs> hours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I did manage to Wham. squeeze in a couple of uh, Vecna references throughout Icewind mm. Dale, just oh, to sort sweet. of seed it through, just in case. Uh, nice. Nothing nothing overt, nothing that made it obvious, but I know that they were interested, so I managed to pop in a couple of 
couple of hints that were there, just enough to to say that he's in the background waiting. Should mm-hmm. you should you wish That's to follow really cool. him? Um, yeah, I think what was the same what recently was... with the obelisks in uh, mm-hmm. in Yethrin. Oh, great! Yeah, mm. I think I think what we'll do, Damien, with your guy, with your guys, with the Icewind Dale guys, we'll move them onto a private uh, listing. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you have you got a full? Has he got a full? You got a full house. Uh, we've got well, not currently. There are two spaces that would be okay. available. Uh, some of okay. which I maybe have some people who are interested, but I need to confirm that. So. Okay. Cool. 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 And for, another uh, probably a conversation for not on the podcast. But yeah. We'll <laughs> yeah. <about>. yeah, <laughs> yeah. About how we how we can work that out. But, uh, yeah. Between, yeah. Between both your games. Uh, cool. Okay, great. So, uh, news for this week. Absolutely. Anything, uh, um, nice transition from villains. Um, we are continuing our IV drip of artwork from the upcoming revised editions of Dungeons and Dragons with two more interesting tidbits. Um, the first, what I'll preface this by saying one of the most interesting things about this kind of drip feed of artwork and information about these books is the sources that they're coming from. So last week we talked a lot about the, uh, or maybe the week before, but in recent weeks we Game talked a lot Informer. about the, the, the player's handbook coming from Game Informer. Mm-hmm. Um, so just this week we had the reveal of the artwork for the cover, the standard cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide, which has come from the Mirror. Yes, yeah, as in the Mirror, the, the <laughs> UK mirror. newspaper, the Mirror, <laughs> which is Amazing. such a strange place to have broken this story and yeah. the the next piece of artwork I'll talk about in a minute came from oh. comicbook.com um n- so again very different <laughs> sources yeah. there <laughs> yeah so we've got video games we've got a UK newspaper um a somewhat infamous UK newspaper and comicbook.com all revealing artwork for a Dungeons and Dragons game. So it's it's a little odd. It's nice to see it so heavily advertised in the sort of cultural zeitgeist, but still it's a little odd the the places and the fact that they're all they're all so different. Mm-hmm. And they're all getting such exclusive access to to these things is is a little odd. But that's a little aside, strange. That aside, mm-hmm. I digress. The the cover for the Dungeon Master's Guide, I actually quite like a lot more than the player's handbook. Um, so no negative ninny here. I do like this cover. Um, it features the red spine. It shows the, the front spine and back cover in full glory with all of the uh, the writing and, and text and everything on it. Um, so it shows a, a good view of what the book will look like. So it has the red spine that we talked about previously, which I do quite like. Um, the cover features a, a pretty great piece of artwork with three uh, iconic villains surrounded by a horde of... Um, skeletons with sort of glowing blue eyes very creepy mm. uh, we have war duke we have skiller and we have optimus prime sorry no <laughs> venger <laughs> venger <laughs> from the dungeons and dragons cartoon who was famously voiced by peter cullen who was optimus prime as well as eeyore i did not and, know that okay yeah, eeyore and the predator and optimus prime and all of these crazy that's the one horned wing one horned red cloaked winged uh character he is the sort of he's at the sort of apex of the picture and skiller and war duke are sort of walking down steps in front of him clearly performing some sort of ritual ahead of them is an army of sort of black boned skeletons with glowing blue eyes and then in the background you may not notice, mm. but it's it's mentioned in the article. There is an uh, uh, Draco Lich in the background orchestrating. Oh, is that what that is? I thought it might thing. have been just like a, a dragon, but yeah, a Draco Lich. Do we know if that's like a named Draco Lich, a character? Said, or? We haven't said. Um, mm-hmm. Before we dive back into the, the interesting thing about these characters, the back cover features a vast cavern, which is uh, a illithid tomb like an an ancient illithid ruin with adventurers very small climbing down some stairs with just the faint Mm -hmm. torch lights igniting their their way uh very cool the the article um was actually uh, an interview with a a guy called josh who's one of the head uh, artists on the on the project and he talked about the fact that they wanted the back of the books to be recognizable in the same way that the front of the books are so if you're looking at the back of the book you still know which book you're looking at right right okay. um, because of the artwork puts it in context the interesting I, thing about I, the f- that does that 
<laughs> yeah, it, it is an odd. I read it and I thought that's an odd. That's an odd mission statement. I, I sort mm. of get it, but it it says what it is on <laughs> on the spine and. Yeah, it's it's an odd mission statement, but I get it, and it's nice to have a a big. It, it's sort of a three quarter piece of artwork with the blurb at the bottom, which I'll get into because it it's interesting to get an idea of the what the book might contain based on the blurb. Mm-hmm. the The cover, interestingly, featuring again artwork from the the Dungeons and Dragons animation, which yeah. poses the question: given how much of this also featured the heroes in the player's handbook. Are we going to see a resurgence of this animation? I think it's uh, highly possible that we that we do end up getting something from them because they do. It's it's odd that they would push them over the multiple books, and I get that it's like an anniversary edition of D and D. But yeah. why introduce them if you're not going to do anything with them? Because realistically, true. not many players are going to use them in their games potentially i wouldn't right. have thought you're not bringing in the the cartoon the characters from the original cartoons unless your players are like really into that already yeah yeah so, we have yeah. had skilla and war duke show up in um uh wild beyond the witch adventure right? spoilers uh, yeah 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 um, <laughs> I, in, a very, in a sort of in a sort of way that doesn't necessarily feel organic uh to wild beyond the witch light but <laughs> um they, i mean they make an appearance uh, no. i think damien i'm really interested by what the back cover says so i've got the image up here on my screen I do too yeah were you going to mention this about uh, how it how they're sticking to the term fifth edition uh yes i was going to mention that absolutely yeah. i was going to read the full thing and and then sort of comment on that yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so it. the the back cover reads as follows This revised and expanded Dungeon Master's Guide provides all the inspiration and guidance you need to create and run a thrilling adventure for the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons game. So, very specifically saying Mm 5th. Inside, you'll find world-building advice, a pre-built yet customizable D&D world, which we now know to be Greyhawk, uh, tricks for creating memorable adventures, hundreds of magic items, rules for player-controlled strongholds, ready-to-use maps and handouts, tips for keeping your players happy and on the edges of their seats, and other tools to help you be a great dungeon master. So a lot of things confirming what we sort of already knew. Yeah, we there. knew about the the castles and... Uh, Bastions, of, I think of, they, they called them in Bastions, the playtest yeah. materials, yeah. yeah. Right, right. And then there's the, a grey bar that says, a companion to the 5th edition player's handbook, parentheses 2024, and monster manual parentheses 2025. Yeah. So they've just they they've stuck with fifth edition. They're just dating it so that we know that this is like the newer version. Gone is the one D and D reference. I think no sixth edition, no five point yeah. five, no one D and D. I heard no, about it is, a while. It yeah. is fifth edition revised. Is what yep. they're, they're calling it. It seems so officially five E R. Maybe is 5ER, there an abbreviation five yeah. E R? Um, I I called this. A year ago or more, I was like, "They're not going to call it One D and D. That's that's <laughs> like a working title." But they're like, "No, no, 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 no. It's going to be One D and D." And I'm like, "Yeah, that worked out so well for D and D Next. Everyone calls Fifth Edition D and D D and D Next, right? Wizards of the Coast? Oh, no. Oh, well, <laughs> it did. It did smack of the Microsoft naming conventions for the Xbox that yeah. I yeah. now yep. cannot keep up with." Like if right. someone tells me they've got an Xbox and then they just say a random letter afterwards to denote which one it is, I'm like, I, I don't. Is that the one with <laughs> the disc tray without the disc tray? Is that the one before this? Like, which one is the the one uh, the one X the one XS? I like just <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Wizard of the Coast, for the very <laughs> least keeping this in the realms Simple. of me being able yeah. to keep up with it. <laughs> yeah, you've got you've got Sony out there saying PlayStation One, PlayStation Two. Two. PlayStation yeah. 3, and so on. It makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, so it's it's very much confirming lots of things uh, about the game. Um, I say it would be incredible, I think, to see a resurgence of the animation um, in a modern, through a modern lens. It yeah. is, it's, I understand it's iconic, but it is quite cheeseball. Uh, it's quite yeah. light and cheesy and yeah. uh, probably not of, of the now. Um, the idea that somebody like Peter Cullen could come back and voice Avenger with a, a fresh coat of paint and 
really that that's quite an exciting. I know that Marvel have had a great amount of success with things like X Men ninety seven. Yeah. Um, uh, also, Amazon we have Prime. We D&D with... Animation. Yes, yeah. Vox yeah. Machina, right. Vox Machina. Right. Uh, and they've had great success with things like in, um, uh, Invincible as well, which is awesome. Check out Invincible. Oh, that's um, great. I love Invincible. It's so fantastic. Um, yeah, the so, comic book's really good. It, yeah, both. Both the book and the slightly sort of updated and, and in the, the creative show. eyes adapted and, and in many ways improved show for some, mm. for some aspects of it. Um, really, really great, but don't spoil yourself. If you're going to do one, do one or the other, because there are heavy spoilers in, in it that could easily be ruined if you, if you're going to kind of jump between the two. So make mm-hmm. a decision and do one of them first. I highly recommend because the spoilers come thick and fast. Um, but it, it, oh, there's a huge resurgence of great animation at the minute. And yeah. I think it would be practically sensible for, for wizards to jump on that bandwagon, uh, and, yeah. and revise their old animation for a new for a new audience. Yeah, um, I think it could be great. Um, like you said, now is the time, man. We're 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 getting some really nice animated shows. I think, and it's, it's interesting because it's been so would they, great. Would it be the sort of thing that they would do as a kids cartoon to try and get kids back into the indie, or would they do it for like people? I think who they'll play the original and do it. Uh, yeah, which is a shame. Really, it would be nice if they could do both because it. That's that's what I would say. Like they should introduce a their own current D and D animation, something a little bit more to like the modern audience sensibility. Because for instance, I I didn't grow up with the cartoon, the D no, cartoon. Same. I I never I never got to see it. I've heard about it down the grapevine. I think I've maybe seen most of the first episode at one point. Um, but I can I mean it's still iconic enough that I recognize the characters like when they showed up in um in the film in the Chris Pine film. Oh, yeah. Um yeah, 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 yeah. which was like, Honor Among Thieves, which was hilarious. But I was like, oh, they look so out of place. Because everybody else is dressed more or less how you would expect for, for Neverwinter. And then there's this kid walking around with a bowl cut and a big pointy green hat or something. And I'm like, yeah. wow, that's great. <laughs> and like a skinny person with a with a, a typical horned viking-esque helmet i think um, i think x-men 97 is probably a great thing to to sort of aspire to with that because yeah, that followed yeah. a sort of somewhat dated but in a very loved animation from de- uh, you know decades ago um right. what's but the line but didn't mm. come back r-rated and, and gritty and super dark but was yeah. enough that a, a, an audience that's grown up become adults can still really enjoy it and love it yeah uh, so i think that yeah. would be a great to model. its credit x-men the original animated series was years ahead of its time oh it yeah came out. oh it yeah was that good it was it, and it was tackling issues that i remember were uncomfortable at the time and depicting characters that were very counterculture which has always sort of been the premise of x-men yeah um yeah. in general of the comics but like As- the animation stayed true to that and that's what made me fall in love with the whole the whole franchise at first as I'm about 80 or 90 issues into Ultimate X-Men at the minute, seeing the, the 2000s take on the X-Men <laughs> is, is very interesting uh, with how they depict certain... certain but they, are, they, are all, they have always mm. been uh, a very sort of allegorical, metaphorical group of heroes that deal with very current and very sensitive issues sure. just, just based on their premise. They've never shied away from that, and it's what I think one of the reasons they are such a loved arm X-Men. of Marvel. X Men's mm-hmm. one of those series that you can absolutely tell the decade in which stories were penned yes. based on <laughs> one how they look, and also what the stories are based on. So the nineties is just yep. all pouches and straps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember Night of the Sentinels starting with Jubilee, like touching a VCR and causing yep. it to spark yeah. out, and you're like, "Well, yes. there you go. You know what decade it's in." <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh gosh! Uh, yeah, it excellent. doesn't. It doesn't stop there. We got another piece of artwork um, for uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and it's the Gold Dragon. We we had a hint of the Gold Dragon on the front cover of the Player's Handbook, but we now have a uh, two full pieces of artwork depicting its full design, uh, and there's some interesting tidbits surrounding that. So this is from ComicBook.com. If you want to read the full article. And it features a a beautiful full spread piece of artwork of a sort of hidden valley. It almost looks, it's kind of a misty hidden valley. It almost looks perhaps 
uh, Scottish or something like that, sort of Scottish Highlands esque, very uh, sort of dark grey stone with mossy grass coverings all over it, with mm. very moist and damp with mist and, and trailing bits of white water coming down the cliffs. And central to that coiling in the middle is this very long, uh, very thin covered golden dragon. The design has shied away from having great big wings and and sort of uh, being very reptilian, uh, certainly in its more modern depictions, and seems to be going back to a much more oriental design, Hmm. uh, inspired by sort of the the, the classic oriental dragon, very long, uh, very flowing. Uh, It has very small wings. Uh, You can see a little clearer in the concept artwork on comicbook.com where you get a full profile of it. It has these kind of stubby wings, still has four legs and and two wings for those of you that can't abide the fact that dragons have six limbs. Um, (laughs) It has a long, a very long neck with a a very wise looking draconic head and then an extremely long fanned tail. Um, And it's more akin to an Eastern dragon, isn't it? Yes, very much. Yeah. Very, very much. I uh, have not seen it yet. I'm, I'm interested to check it out. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, again, the, the article talks about the design philosophy behind these dragons being taking the uniqueness of each one and running with that, making yeah, them right. look like they come from a certain biome, making them look like they have certain abilities over their brethren. Um, and also it talks in this article specifically about making the dragons look more like they are intelligent, spell-casting, talking creatures. They cite that new players might look at a dragon and see a fierce a fierce monster, where in actuality they are some of the most intelligent and capable sentient creatures in Dungeons & Dragons. Right. So trying to give yeah, them unless that... Unless it's a white dragon. Well, unless it's a white <laughs> dragon, and then it's just it wants to freeze you and bite your limbs off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in it's, that order? it's... In that order. It's... it's yeah. a, it, no, no warm meat. It's got to be cold. Um, they're like a cold meal to do uh, a it's frozen, true. a frozen meal without defrosting it. Do white dragons like? Uh, yeah. Frozen yeah. dwarf. Fair enough. So, <laughs> on a stick. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this this is beautiful very artwork. Cool. Uh, of I, I do very much like that the dragons look a lot more unique individually now. It seems. Um, the, the, I don't dislike the current artwork for them, but they are all very. They follow a, a, a pattern, and they're yeah, very cl- they're yeah, very, very close to so. it. Each of them very close to that pattern, uh, whereas this is very much more unique looking for each for each one. Nice. I, I found the image to... of the of the gold dragon. That's very cool. Very beautiful. I look very, forward to seeing the blue dragon. Cool. I have a soft spot yeah. for blue dragons. Uh, what if so... I have gills? They they're like yep. coastal on they blue blue and is it coastal and oddly wrong? desert as well they 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 feature That's a lot in right. the desert yeah. too mm-hmm. um, yeah, so they could go either way greens greens are my favorite the conniving schemers the liars the tricksters I love yeah. that they're so personable well they're my favorite chromatics silver are my favorite metallics. I think I, think I say silver are my are my favorite yeah yeah I I always fall into the trap of if there is a significant silver dragon in a campaign. <clears throat> <clears throat> certain adventures i won't mention here for spoilers um but uh i i always fall into the trap of trying to do uh a dragon heart accent for them a la sean connery of course like, yes thank you for waking me up my friends how may i ever repay you that sort of thing i had that movie um, on vhs I, I love that movie to this I day that, i love so. that movie <laughs> and that's a great that's it's a beautiful so that's dragon a design movie. it's a great <laughs> yeah. great dragon design it too is. It is um, for like 96 or whenever that film yeah. came out. It was really good. Mm. The, the CGI holds up weirdly. Absolutely. So head to comicbook.com for your Gold Dragon and The Mirror for your Dungeon Master's Guide cover if you want to see the full interview with the artists behind the artwork and learn a bit more about the the philosophies behind them. One thing I do appreciate about the, the front cover of the Dungeon Master's Guide, I don't know if any of you noticed this, but it looks to me like Venger, the spell that Venger is casting is the and symbol from the Dungeons and Dragons logo? Oh, the ampersand. Okay. Yeah, it it, uh... it, it, it looks like that with a trailing, uh, sort of trailing uh, line coming off it, a bit longer than it does in the in the design. Um, I'm assuming that's deliberate. It does look like it's meant to be that. Interesting. Uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm I'm intrigued by that Draco Lich in the background. I can't wait. Absolutely. To yeah, can't wait to see the artwork for Draco Lich. 
because that's mm-hmm. going to be cool. Yeah. Um, final nice. piece of D&D news. It seems like one of the CEOs of Hasbro, um, uh, 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 based on a recent Reddit post, has mentioned a specific campaign setting that they would like to see and play in. Uh, so mm. this was Chris Cox would like to explore Karatur, which is yeah. the Oriental sort of Eastern inspired setting of Forgotten Realms. Um, it's apparently played in that campaign and would like to see it return. It has been a long time since we've seen official materials for it, not since the 80s. I don't think there's been any official materials for it other than just mentions in the rule books in terms of its location. Right. Um, right. Oriental Adventures in 85 um, was probably the, the, the most significant Recent one that they actually released. Campaign setting, yeah. Um, I don't think there's really any modern Dungeons & Dragons settings that heavily skew in that, that style. Uh, I know Pathfinder has done it. They have a book recently for uh, Tian Shaw, uh, a, a full setting mm. guide for Tian Shaw, which is very... Yeah, Eastern Oriental inspired setting. Um, nice. Whether this gets any traction, I don't know, but it's a CEO of Hasbro. So <laughs> if he's got I any mean, sway right. in the company, he might be able to pull <laughs> some strings and make this happen. And I think it would be, it, it would be very cool. It, it, it right. is because I think, uh, I think we talked previously about the fact that the sort of design philosophy behind Eastern uh, and or, Oriental monsters is very different to Western. Um, they're a little wilder and a little more colorful and a little more expressive, uh, at least right. in my opinion, from monster designs from, you know, film and TV and video games. They always tend to have much more exuberant and, and kind of wild creature design um, mm. based, of course, on some of their, their myths and legends. Uh, I know sure. the, the Oni appear in the Monster Manual, of course, um, and, and yeah, some other... trying to think of what, what we have at the moment. Yeah, the Oni is the Zhongxi. Oh, yeah, the from uh, We have the, the Zhongxi from, from Ben Richten, uh, yeah, Ben Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, yes. which is like the hopping vampire myth, which is yeah. really cool. I, I remember um, those from Super Mario. <laughs> yeah, those, <laughs> yeah. those in Super Mario when I played that on Game Boy. Um, I think, you know, honestly, I know that the Kenku are kind of their own thing, but I believe they stem from... Uh, and a sort of Japanese tradition of having raven folk, which or like raven esque demons, but demons used liberally, not the same way that we classify demons in D anD. d And they were based more on, I think it's the Tengu, and then out of that, the Tengu, yeah, the Kenku, yeah, yeah. There's um, the Kappa as well, which is I think that appears yeah, in Pathfinder. Kappa. Um, the I, the creature that lives under the water that has a little bowl on the top of its head. Its as head like, well, its head is a bowl. It doesn't. It, yeah. Its head is a bowl. Its, it's is skull bowl. is concave and has <laughs> yeah, water exactly. in it. Uh, very cool looking. Uh, it almost looks like a, a cross between a bird and a turtle and a person. It's very right, cool. Right. Um, so yeah. it would be nice. It would be nice to see um, that that come to fruition and, and get a, a, a very very different part of Forgotten Realms to, to play in. Um, but yeah, if you yeah. if you're looking for that now, then it looks like Pathfinder currently has the the market share on that. They have a, a whole setting designed around that philosophy. So check that are they, out. Are they do they do they have um, any other cultures featured in there at all? In Pathfinder, hmm. uh, I think I I, I I haven't played a, a great deal of Pathfinder, uh, and they've just had a second edition um, very relatively recently that. Is getting a lot of new source books for. I think it's Lost Omens is the, is their equivalent of Forgotten Realms, and they're releasing books for sort of each of the core regions, which is something I don't think wizards ever really do is release region books. They did the they did the Sword Coast Adventurers Guide, but since that, there isn't really a. They only yeah, ever really cover. Done that for edition, no. They only ever really cover regions if they're featuring an adventure like Icewind Dale, um, yeah, Rhyme sure. of the Frost Maiden. So, it seems like Pathfinder are releasing. Lots of books, each focused on a part of the world. So you will get mm. quite a disparate spread of, of <clears throat> cultures in the same way that Forgotten Realms has quite a, a spread of cultures too. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Because it's nice that they've done, like, obviously they've done Greek culture with the... Um, Theros. Theros, yeah. yeah. Theros, yeah, yeah, which is really cool. And uh, unofficially it's, it's with the... Odyssey of the Dragon Lords, which is excellent. Yeah. Oh, really? There's a oh, lot yeah, of, of, yeah, um, Lords, yeah, of there's obviously a lot of African inspiration, African culture inspiration in Tomb of Annihilation because yep. of the Isle of Chalts. 
Um, cool. There's, I I guess we haven't gotten a lot of stuff to do with like the lower, like about south of the Sword Coast, Callum Shan, yeah, that sort of. Um, well, is yeah. that like Aust- Australasia? Is that kind of like what you would say is that sort of south? Is it or? It's it's more like the Middle East. Um, Callum right. Shan, Callum Port, they're like heavily inspired by. I think like uh, you know major cities like Morocco and and things like that. So desert desert um, type sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in the further south and east you get it kind of continues that vague tradition. The whole idea behind the Forgotten Realms is that they're forgotten because they are a part of Earth's history. So Earth is technically canon in Forgotten Realms history. Really? Um, it's just a, yeah, yeah, in a weird way. And there's um I believe published in a book, not in fifth edition, but in a book from way back when. There's even a specific house address in, I think it's Ohio. Uh, I, I know a couple of people listening to this podcast have told me about this and, and will will be the first to correct me. But there's a specific house address for someone living in the United States that is like appears in a D&D book. It's ridiculous. What? <laughs> yeah. That's a bit, that's a bit like... Uh... Yeah, a bit fourth warry breaking, isn't it? Mm. A, a little bit. I, I I think I'm not doing injustice in in describing how like the the earth the realm of earth, our earth, and the forgotten realms were once joined. But there is deep sort of lore on that, um, which I'm sure many other people know better than me. Inspiration sort of from Lord of the Rings and how that was supposed to be, like like a um, forgotten history of a yeah. neighboring history, realm, or like of, of right. earth, yeah. I yeah, do, I do enjoy similar. breaking the fourth wall with characters. I did it with Morden Kanan once um, in an adventure, um, and mm. he he used the term "when in Rome" very sp- specifically. <laughs> and it was very funny because all of the players immediately jumped on it, and we were all sort of cue biting each other of like, "What's Rome? What is that? What is this place?" While Morden mm. Kanan is sort of saying, "Oh, please not," so <laughs> sort of getting very frustrated <laughs> as he realized what he'd done. They have magic a, in Rome. <laughs> it was a great role playing moment because everybody just sort of as you would, like, where is this Rome that you speak of and fell on him about what he was talking about? And he responded with, I shouldn't have said anything. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, throw if with characters that it yeah. makes sense, throw a bit of fourth wall breaking in. It's, it's yeah. good fun. Actually it come to think of it canonically Elminster as well. Also is a bit of a fourth wall breaker slash related to earth because he says he constantly hangs out with Ed Greenwood an yeah, author yeah. in this, in this strange realm, which is of course why Elminster is a write-in character for Ed Greenwood. Ah, uh, multiverse. Vex, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Finally, final piece of news. If a uh, very short one, if you want something very different with the fifth edition rule set, to what we've talked about, uh, then Void Runners, the Void Runners Codex box set, is getting a mm. Kickstarter, and this is for fifth edition and level up advanced fifth edition, uh, and it's a science fiction setting, Ooh. spaceships uh, with uh, very futuristic designs. It, it's uh, called the Void Runners Codex. It'll feature the Void Runners Codex, which is a hardcover containing new player options, equipment, psionics, and more. Uh, it will also have a Star Captain's Manual for details on starships, space travel and exploration, starship combat, along with rules for building your own spaceships, and Escape from the Death Planet, uh, an introductory adventure for characters level 1 to 3 that can get you off the planet of uh, Nine Moon before the Imperium destroys it, plus tokens, mm. maps, narrator screen, and more. Uh, it isn't live on Kickstarter yet, but it is coming soon, so you can notify yourself uh, when it's coming up. If you're interested in some spaceships and uh, sci-fi 5e very cool the artwork is this, does look is this... very nice for it it's beautiful yeah the the books look very very high end if if you were to to fund this i don't think you'd be upset with the production values no. nice is this based on the web 3 game uh, i am not sure because uh, there's a thing called void runners which is a spaceship game where you get to design your own ships, but it's a Web3 game. So it's like, um, sits on the blockchain. Ah, not uh, sure. I, I don't know. Not sure. It doesn't yeah. mention it specifically. It, yeah, so the, the new story that I read didn't mention um, it either. Right. Okay. Yeah, mint your ships. Yeah, I so see it that. May just Might be, just one be of those a similar name. Generic name, yeah. 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 And um, if you are wanting a science fiction fantasy crossover, with a similar Dungeons and Dragons rule set, and don't want to wait for this, 
Uh, I should mention Paizo of Pathfinder fame also have Starfinder, which I know is yeah. growing in popularity yeah. and has a very similar aesthetic to this. So um, yeah. ch pick your poison. Right. It, uh, we I have a wealth of options available yeah. to us. I find it difficult to combine sci-fi and fantasy stuff together. It's The concept, I think, is cool. I just don't think I found anyone that I that I like enough to really get into. Mm. It is hard. Um, probably the, the person who's done it best is probably George Lucas. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, that's probably the person that's done it best. Um, yeah. Mixing fantasy and science fiction almost seamlessly. It is, it is tricky when you're seeing dragons in space and uh, goblins in uh, astronaut helmets holding, with laser guns. Holding and laser guns, yeah. It, it can be... <laughs> It can it can skew too far into the realm of ridiculous just by its very existence, just because those mm. two those two aspects there is science fiction and fantasy, and the fact that they are segregated like that almost presupposes right. that putting them together is wrong. <laughs> I think it, I think yeah. it's something wrong with my brain because there is absolutely no reason that it makes less sense than fantasy by itself or sci-fi by itself. Yeah, by by its very nature, it's it's me. <laughs> I just, I really wish. Other than Star Wars, it's you're totally you, right, James. and I think, and I think Star Wars uh, gets a pass because it's so the fantasy it's elements of it. Well, it's its own setting, but the fantasy elements of it are sort of just the Jedi, and yeah, there's everything no else, dragons. Everything else could sort of be hand waved as oh, it's sci-fi or it's uh, yeah. it's well, yeah, it's a little mm. weird, but it's, it's an alien. They might have a psychic ability or whatever, but it's not fantasy. It's just. You know, there's right. like a scientific. It borrows heavily, but it's it. not Tolkien esque, yeah. where you literally see dwarves and goblins running around. Yeah, right. it definitely, it definitely has like a fantasy. It's definitely fantasy themed. Like the whole thing with like Jabba's yeah. palace and the rag yeah. rag and all that he's got underneath the, the thing, and you know that could easily have been like you know a, effectively a dragon type creature. The Dark Lord, the, the Black Knight, yeah, the Princess, the yeah, 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 the exactly, Wizard. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The the only thing about it that doesn't sort of ring ring well with me in, in like the crossover is you don't have a definitive list of races in the galaxy there's literally like the, a new race could just suddenly appear like there's this thing and you're like oh yeah. who, the hell, who the hell are those guys mm. like you walk into the star wars canteen and you're like oh my good god what the hell is this i've always like, found yeah. that <laughs> it's like, i've always found that a little nuts. frustrating because it, that, uh, the cantina is a great example. When you see some of the, the more famous creatures from Star Wars, like the Mon Calmari and uh, the the Duros, uh, yeah. the, all the of Twilight, these, yeah. the Twilight, they, although they get quite a lot of screen time, to be fair, the, yes, the Twilight. Yeah, but, um, and then you get sort of newer movies that throw in all these new ones. It's like, well, I'd kind of like to see the Mon Cal home planet, and I'd kind of like yeah. to see, sure. you know... I, I kind of want to expand their lore a little bit rather than just have 15 more creatures that yeah. I've got to try and memorize. Yeah, right. Mm. It, just, it, just, it, just seem, it just seems everyone just wants to hang out in the Outer Rim. Like everybody from all these other races, they just want to go to the Outer Rim and just mm -hmm. hang out there. It's yeah. like, what about, like, it's like, let's go to like these really cool planets. Let's go to like Kessel, like that fucking uh, incredible mining sure. like thing. You know, we, 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 I want to see the Kessel run. It's the same we reason. It's the same reason, that... didn't we? We did. Oh, yeah. was, it, was it Han Solo? In, in, in the Solo, Solo movie, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I'm not, I've not, I've not seen that for obvious reasons. It's not right. bad. It's not <laughs> bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's not It's, it's bad, a movie. But it's not good. The Kessel, it's, it's the Kessel Run, the Kessel Run segment might be one of the better parts of the film. To be fair. Okay. Well, I'm I pleased. Think... I'm pleased you get to see that because that would be like the thing that I would watch it to watch. I'd be like, yeah, yeah let's see the run. Let's, yeah. let's see the Kessel Run. Does well, he do it in five parseps or how many parseps it is? <laughs> uh he does yeah he basically he finds a shortcut that he's not supposed to um but oh, right. that's how okay. that works yeah because because that's the only explanation for why he's he can do the kessel run in that short of a in a distance because parsecs isn't a measure of time it's a measure of distance right yeah so right. that's that's what it is and people for years were like but parsec that that phrase makes no sense you know that parsecs are distance and so the movie finally explains like how he did that he finds a shortcut oh, which is actually right. i i thought it was rather clever and, and well done and it was a fun sequence to watch yeah yeah but I is it the best film overall no of course no, i think what rob said about the everyone wanting to hang out in the outer rim is probably the reason why the uh, the three fantasy flight now edge star wars role-playing games of the mm. of the three which was force and destiny age of rebellion and edge of the empire i think edge of the empire was vastly more popular than the other two 
because it's yeah. the bounty, it's the outer rim, it's the bounty hunters, it's the smugglers, it's that sort of Dark darker Valley. edge. Yeah. Um, Edge of the Empire was more about the Rebellion versus the Empire, and then Force and Destiny was obviously more about Jedi. I'm currently writing a Star Wars Age of Rebellion adventure uh, loosely based on a covert mission from World War II. Um, Nice. Which which, 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 which which mission? Uh, It was called Operation Gunnerside. Okay, okay. cool. And Uh, what what happened in it? So they... They were basically trying to infiltrate a factory that was producing uh, heavy water or hard water. I forget the exact terminology without looking at it, but for mm. nuclear weapons. Mm. And That's so they wanted cool. to to shut this factory down, basically. And they sent in oh, wow. a group to sort of lay the groundwork. Um, it was in Europe and it was, it was sort of lay the groundwork for the mission. Then they sent a second mission in. Uh, yeah low flying gliders over the landscape which failed because of inclement weather and they crashed and died or were captured tortured and uh eventually killed and then the third mission operation gunnerside was the one that went in and finally succeeded in infiltrating the factory and destroying the Brilliant. the parts of it that were producing this material for for nuclear weapons um so, sick. so i'm I, i'm writing Brilliant. an adventure right now that's loosely based on that uh which would see a return to the planet of hoth um hmm cool so yeah i i love i love i love all the, the world war Two operations that went on like there's yeah, so many there's so many of these fucking amazing things that, that went that went down like mm. have you guys have you guys familiar with oh what's his fucking name the writer he he basically um he wrote operation mincemeat and Agent yeah. zigzag yeah yeah both of those books fan fucking tastic didn't ian yeah. fleming have a hand in operation mince me i'm not incorrect in thinking that. yeah i believe he i believe he did yeah yeah yeah, yeah he did. Hmm. but like but like but like those I, I don't know if you're familiar with these operations jc but like no like, no i don't think so so, 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 so operation mince me was um basically what they did is they got a, they got a, a a tramp who had died in king's cross station dressed him up he had no family no family to speak of they dressed mm. him up as a as a as a naval officer and shot him out of a cannon onto a beach in Cyprus or I think it was Cyprus or somewhere like that with papers Whoa. with, was it Cyprus or was it, it was, a, it was a Spanish beach. I know no, okay. not Cyprus obviously, but some, some beach in the Mediterranean because the Spanish got hold of his body. <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. Obviously the Spanish were neutral, but inside it, but he had a briefcase <laughs> attached to him by with Hank with handcuffs, which had all these secret wow. documents of how they were going to um, in- invade Sicily. This was, sounds familiar. I, get, I, I think get, I've I'm heard kidding. the beginning of this story, but from the part mm. where the Spanish discover him on the beach, I oh. thought it was. I thought I thought it had something to do with the D-Day plans. It was something to do with something, wasn't it? But I, know, I think, I know Rob's, clo- I think Rob's closer. It was a, a, maybe Sicily. Yeah. Or like they were pretending yeah. they were going to invade there and ended up invading yeah. somewhere different. Um, yeah. It was just loose, to throw them off the scent. Right. There's a loose yeah. reference to that in. It, it, went straight, it went straight to Hitler, and Hitler was like, "Fuck." They're going to do this. Uh, right, well, uh, uh, let's move our troops from there to there. And it was all set up by MI5. That's yeah. wild. They well, shot to, them out of a cannon. To, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry, yeah, Rob, Rob was white. It is the allied invasion of Sicily that they were yeah. setting up. Yeah, there yeah. you go. There you go. Yeah. To keep this in the, in the realm of RPGs and World mm. War II missions that are crazy, um, there's an RPG called The Night Witches. Uh, oh. which is, you have my attention. Which is based on <laughs> the real world Night Witches also cool. known as the 588 the Night Bomber Regiment, yeah. who were yep. all-female oh. Soviet pilots who would fly um, quite simplistic sort of low-tech planes at night over German forces, turn off their engines, and bomb them silently as they would fly over undetected. Badass. Wow. Some of wow. the most badass <laughs> women I think I've ever heard of. Uh, just That's turning amazing. off their engines and gliding, and they would be called the Night Witches because the sound of their silent planes swooping over at night sounded like broomsticks. Oh, that's um, so fucking sick. <laughs> <laughs> what an, and and there, is a, there is an RPG called the Night Witches. I haven't played it, but um, it's like 20 quid um, UK money to get hold of, uh, and it might be a fun... If you're into World War II... Uh, oh, yeah, and it's totally my jam. Yeah, and RPGs, yeah. it might be yeah. worth picking that up. But that's that story. Like some of the stories from World War Two, there's a reason it's so as heavily as any... inspired on everything pop culture wise. Mm. Oh yeah, a, you guys, you film... guys. Oh, go on, go on, go on, James. Oh, sorry. There's a new film um, come out the or, uh, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Um, yeah, it's got, yeah, yeah. Pretty, it's yeah, got yeah, some exactly. pretty big names in, and it was it, before the movie came out. I. I listened to a podcast about the the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. I was like, this is a fucking brilliant 
idea to have in, like in World of Adenia. It's like, yeah. right, so I've got the Order of Unchivalrous War Warfare. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, in, yep. that's in my game now. They're all the spies and assassins uh, that work for the king, doing all the dirty work that's not right. chivalrous. I love <laughs> yeah, a good secret right. society slash weird order slash cult. Like, that that stuff gets me going for for my D and D games. I'll always oh, yeah, have one. You can nice. always you can always count on some sort of secret organization in one of my adventures, um, because yeah. it's just that much more fun. I don't know. There's something about that that I've I've always been fascinated by. Well, that's um, why. It but was... hey, to tie mm -hmm. this back to from the night uh, witches to D and D, and then back to Star Wars again. <laughs> there's the knights. <laughs> which we were talking about like how how fantastic in the terms of fantasy is star wars and the night sisters straight up use magic yeah i yeah, mean yeah, they're, yeah. They're, that's that's magic through and through they call it the force right they use it in a different way but there's green glowing stuff and they can't they cast spells and and have verbal and somatic components so as far as i'm concerned yeah. <laughs> pure magic and there is a technically of course a dragon in um in uh star wars lore the the, the crate is, dragon dragon yeah the crate right, dragon. Yeah. yeah the crate dragon yeah true very yeah, true yeah so it's not it's not winged but hey there's a few dragons that aren't winged oh. in D &D too so yeah uh, cool it's, yeah. it's such a bizarre because star wars you can take to world war ii you can take it into fantasy you can take mm -hmm. it into hard science fiction with droids and clones okay. uh you've there's a there's a room for all of those and more in star wars which is yeah. One of the reasons I think it's so enduring um, and why I was inspired by because Andor heavily, heavily inspired me. If you take all of the Star Wars out of Andor and turned it into a World War II thriller, it would be just as good. It would be um, just as good. Yeah. So Star Wars was, is the backdrop for it. Something yeah. I've noticed, though, recently with Star Wars, as I've like sort of like paid a lot of attention to it recently because of like Acolyte coming out and stuff, and I've been, just been, mm. just been going over like some films and some TV shows and stuff, is that you've got all these races in it, right? Yet there is prejudice towards the dro towards the droids. Always. Have you, no have you noticed mm -hmm. how the droids are treated Always. like like, like yeah. they're absolute scum, or like they're yeah. like really bottom of the bottom of the pile? Yet surely they're they're intelligent and they're artificial intelligence. And I'm no I've, but it's it hasn't been addressed in any of the future stuff, which I'm surprised about. I feel like there again, is a blame. great segment in Solo that you would really enjoy oh, really? about this, Rob. Oh, yeah, it, <laughs> it literally it goes into <laughs> like droid oh, rights. Wow, okay. Uh, oh, and droid wow, okay. sentience and right, droid romance and oh. it gets it gets it pushes the envelope a little bit in not terms to, of that not to okay. harp on it but there's a lot of emotion shown in a droid <coughs> excuse me in a droid in andor as well um yeah and i have yeah. my theories about that droid um <laughs> but, yes there is a a, cool. a series of sequences that depict a droid experiencing emotion and people treating it like a person uh in in a moment of grief so it is, it is, I think it is starting to change mm. a little. I think it probably comes from, because R2-D2 and C-3PO, if I'm not mistaken, were inspired by characters in uh, like Kurosawa movies who were sort of the bumbling, yeah. the bumbling that's, that's... sidekick duo who were very yeah. sort of daft and, and comedy relief. So it probably stems, I think, from that originally. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. I think maybe but in that's... world you can say that due to the whole trade federation thing, droids are maybe Does kept that at arm's length and treated poorly <laughs> yeah, because yeah. of that. Like, oh, remember when the droids all had an uprising? <laughs> now we're not so keen on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. But manipulated by, you know, organics the whole time, really. So, yeah. There is that. So. As we, we, I'm not sure if we have any tales from the table this week, but I have something else for us to to briefly get Ooh. into. Then, as I yeah. have for my for my friends at home, I have started to run a Strixhaven game because I uh, I really wanted to get into it, and they're all Harry Potter fans. <laughs> so, as part of that, though, um, you have to do quizzes in universe to pass exams now you can do dice roll checks for these but of course that's not good enough for me so i wanted to set my friend's actual homework uh, <laughs> so great i have a true or false quiz here that i set my players and oh I'm god if you would want to give it a go <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see how yeah well you let's would do. do it let's do Gosh. it 
Okay, just, so just, this, just, just pop, is this, just is this pop Google up a second? One second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is this Trishaven specific trivia or is it like uh, just D yes. general trivia? Oh, uh, a bit, a bit, a bit of both. <laughs> this quiz okay. is specifically um, on owl bears. Oh god. Oh, god. Okay. I'll definitely get this wrong. Okay. Yeah. Cool, then. So I've got ten questions. It's true, true or false for each. Okay. okay. So. Go okay. All right. Owl bears are docile creatures and rarely attack unless provoked. True. False. False. I would have said false. False. False, false. is correct. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, annoying. So that's one, one minus one for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Two. Owl bears often live in caves or ruins, using the bones of their prey as their beds and playgrounds. Mm. True. I'm going to say true. true. I'm going to say yeah. true. Uh, true is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Albert, a bit sinister. Three. Albert primarily use their venomous fangs to attack their prey. False. <laughs> False. False. They got a beak, in they? Yes, yeah. they do have a beak. No venomous fangs for the Alberts. I do like. Okay. I do like you guys. Have you guys seen Cobra Kai on Netflix? When um, I don't know if you've seen. You probably haven't seen it. I have seen Cobra Kai. Kai I've yeah. seen the first. Oh, okay. I've seen the first okay. season. I never got beyond that. Sadly. When uh, when uh, the, the, the the um what's his chops um. Oh, I, forget, I forget the name of the guy, the blonde haired guy. Johnny. Uh, Johnny, that's it. Where Johnny sets up mm. his own dojo and he calls it Eagle Fang. Yeah. <laughs> Eagle, oh, yeah. right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, really, really uh, funny. Really, cl- really, a fans. really clever way, a really clever way of showing how stupid he is, but also how kind of clever he is as well. It's right, really, right, really, right. It's really Eagle, Eagle Fang. With, with the humor. Yeah, yeah it's pretty yeah. really yeah. funny. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Sorry, carry on, James. No, on. Number four. <laughs> Some scholars <laughs> believe that owlbears were created by a kooky wizard in a breeding experiment gone awry. I'm going to say true. Correct. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. It is true. And that is just yeah. general owlbear lore. So they were yeah. originally created by a wizard. Okay. Yeah. They're thought to be the first. I think I've, I've heard that they're thought to be the first magical anomaly like monstrosity, like magically mm. created monstrosity. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Elves, elves universally yep. agree that the owlbears were created by a wizard and have never existed in the Feywild. I don't know this one. I'm going to say no. false. I'm going to say true. I don't ever s- remember seeing them depicted heavily in the Feywild, so I'm going to go with true just for that reason. Yeah, true. Uh, it is false, Jason. Oh, is correct false. on this one. Apparently, yeah. there are some elves who believe that they are also naturally occurring in the Feywild, although their first appearance in D&D That's what, Yeah, there, there's a segment of lore that stuck out in my brain for that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh. Cupcakes and muffins can help calm an owlbear's foul temper. Why does that sound familiar? True. True. <laughs> Shit, wait. <laughs> <laughs> It does, be, it does sound familiar, true. but now I'm wondering if I'm confusing it with something else. I'm going to say true. It is true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God. And <laughs> there is a follow-up. The next question is a follow-up question. So, arcade arcano biologists believe that sweets like cupcakes and muffins can ease an owlbear's rumbling acid reflux. True or false? True. False. False. It is true. Oh, is it? Oh, wrong. oh, there's my first one wrong. I win. I win. <laughs> Did I win? Was, uh, was anyone? Was I anyone keeping the score? Because I've, I've won, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> so, uh, owl bears respond best to training that involves mimicking the desired behaviour, such as crawling on hands and knees to teach them to be mounts. Hmm. Ooh, false. False? <laughs> I've not heard this. I don't know. I'm going to say false. Rob? Oh, Rob's already won. Never mind. <laughs> true. Uh, it is true. He's yeah, doing well. Okay. Right. Now, Bear, you need to mimic him. Um, okay. I, I, I thought the general consensus of the lore was that they're practically untrainable. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, hang on, there you go. They're going to. And, okay, mm-hmm. so nine. An owl bear's screech is identical to the cry of a normal owl. True. We're True. Getting to, we're getting to the hard ones now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say. This is like a trick question. I'm going right to say now. false. I'm going to say it's a mix of the two animals, so false. It, it is false. Yes, oh, it is a false. mix of okay. the two. There is a bear rumble to the owl's screech. Okay. Um, so owls suffer from indigestion. 
just like owlbears, which makes it difficult to distinguish between their cries, true or false. Um, well, false because they sound like bears. Now, now that we know, yeah, I would false. say false. Yeah. Right. It is false. Right. So okay. I, I wasn't right. keeping score of what everyone got. So seven out of ten for me. I won. I won. <laughs> I got, yeah, Rob, Rob, Rob just won. wins. I, mean? I think I got three wrong. wrong. I think I got three wrong. So I think yeah, seven yeah. right. I think, I think Damien okay. and I are tied, and Rob won. And what <laughs> other one? <laughs> um, you've won the gloating right. You pa- <laughs> yeah, bragging <laughs> rights. Uh, bragging, uh, bragging rights. That's a, that's a given. What do I win? Yeah. What's my prize? Yeah. Do I get, do I get uh, some gumpler? Maybe. Yeah, nope. <laughs> you get a free owl bear plushie, redeemable mm. at Strixhaven College. Actually, <laughs> putting a Boring. putting a call out, putting a call out to our players. If you know of anywhere where I can get plushies Rob, made some from drawings. <laughs> what? If anyone knows where I can get the Strixhaven mascots in plushy form, please let me know because I want them to give to my players in person. Probably here. When they cool. find them. So uh someone someone tell me. My mm. my friends like cuddly toys. <laughs> Sweet. Well, nice one, James. That was that was good fun. Yeah, uh, that was good. Cool. That was fun. Well, thanks for tuning in this, for this uh, this week's podcast, guys. Uh, we will return the next week, I believe. Yes. Yeah. I don't think I've got anything on next Thursday. I have it in the afternoon. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Not cool. during the day. Sweet. Not today. Sweet. Well, yeah. Nice one, guys. Uh, well, take care, and we'll hear you guys. Well, you'll, you'll hear us <laughs> next week. Adios, amigos. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.